Welcome to the Psychedelic Suitcase. I'm Dave McNee. This is the first episode of the new year that we've put out, um, and it's a little late in coming out, so my apologies. Um, one of the challenges of traveling, we're currently in, in Portugal, is not having access to a reliable uh, Wi-Fi signal or sometimes even electricity. So we've had to get a little creative in how we produce the podcast. Um, in order to get some of the interviews, we had to leave where we're staying for a few days and get somewhat closer to civilization. So that's what we did. We spent a few days in Lisbon and in Sintra, and then a few more in Lagos. Um, not only did we get a bunch of interviews done, but we also got the website up and running. So psychedelicsuitcase.com is now live, so check it out. And once again, you can always find us on Instagram or uh, Facebook. The first interview that we recorded was with Daniel Shankin, who runs the website TAM Integration. It's a great resource for anyone looking to learn how to integrate what they've experienced during a psychedelic trip. I hope you enjoy the conversation. It starts with me asking Daniel if he had a good New Year. New Year's was really nice. It's like, um, you know, it, it was a new baby New Year's. That's great. The first? Um, yeah. Yeah. We have a six, um, six week old. Right. And he doesn't like to, he, you know, his idea of partying is very, very chill. <laughs> I would imagine you know, so. <laughs> he's just like, you know, he's just, he likes to be rubbed on the face with a stuffed dragon and, you know, sung to. Right. Um, like, yeah, it's not a bad thing. But that's, yeah. no, I mean, yeah, it, it's, so it's really a sweet, it's a sweet time here at the house. I bet. Yeah, that's fantastic. Just sort of, kind of just, um, it, you know, in, you know, to use a buzzword, we're integrating him into the family. Exactly. You know, exactly. Just we're so, all integrating, you know, we're just becoming a new thing. We're transforming into a new thing and trying to do that consciously and sweetly. Definitely. So you're saying that this is your, this is the first child? Yes. Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, I bet it, I bet things do you have any are, kids? no, no, I don't. Uh, no, it's, um, I taught for many years. So I feel like I, I've had a lot of, contact with uh young people i guess but <laughs> but never any of my own right. no no yeah no that's i've mostly only taught adults right i found that i was really I'm, I'm better suited to teaching people who have chosen to be there yes no kidding i know <laughs> it does make a big difference for sure for sure um so yeah that's great well like once again thanks for being on the show um I just wanted to obviously kind of start with uh, your background and uh, your sort of journey in, into all of this. Um, just reading in, in a bit of your bio about, uh, it seems like in 1998, roughly, you had some sort of an experience that sort of changed things for you. I was trying to, I was, you know, I had a pretty decent yoga practice mm -hmm. and I was just very curious if I could like get enlightened by doing yoga and taking psychedelics. Right. And that kind of didn't exactly work. Right. Um, it, <laughs> right. Um, it worked a little. It yeah. kind of, it, it nudged me into, into a place where um, I saw what was possible. Right. You know, it sort of like opens up, like it, it showed me like a context for everything. That like, right. oh, this is, this is the actual field that you're playing on. Right. right? Because up until... Up until this point, you know, like my use had been very recreational. Yeah, yeah. And it was almost accidentally spiritual. Once I started doing yoga practice, which I really liked, you know, um, yeah. you know, at, in, in, there was a guy named John Perry in Eugene, Oregon, who taught in a dance studio for $3, suggested donation. He had a basket. And nobody, there was one guy that had a rubber yoga mat and everybody else practiced on um, carpet squares. Okay. Yep. <laughs> and, and it was, yeah, it, it was very homey. It was a very grassroots kind of yoga, yoga practice. But when I first started doing the practices, um, the teachings, you know, the teachings sort of get into your head right? and they were started to inform my recreation. And then all of a sudden it ceased somehow, like it switched from being recreational to being kind of ceremonial and psycho-spiritual. I can only imagine it's a good combination. Um, and I think one obviously will further the other, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, no, that's great. And you started teaching it was in 2002. Is that when you? Yeah. 
Yeah, because I needed to ground my experience because I was sort of new at it. You know, I was and I was a young kid, mm-hmm. and so I realized like I needed a lot. There was no word integration back then, right? Um, you know, and all we had was like be here now, right? right. That was like I had I had be, I had be here now. I had a Terrence McKenna book and yeah. I had Sacred Mirrors by Alex Gray, right? <laughs> and, and then and a bunch of yoga books, yeah, right? Yeah. And then like the Heart Sutra and the Yoga Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita and things like that, right? And so I kind of saw that like, oh, this is what we do. This is the work that I have to do to get to the exalted state that I had a, a glimpse of right. in, my, in my trip. TAM integration. Um, when did you start that? And uh, if you could talk about, I've kind of, well, I've gotten a lot of resources from there myself, but um, if you could talk about some of the resources that are available to people on the site. Well, I had been sort of helping out in, with various kind of psychedelic projects over the years. Yeah. And I had been at the same time, you know, doing teaching yoga and doing coaching. Right. You know, coaching is kind of really nice because you get to work one-on-one with people and um, work with people about, you know, their concerns and, helping to serving more than helping just serving people on their journeys. And, right. and the wave sort of kind of started to crest, you know, people were, you know, more and more people wanted to know about this sort of stuff. Right. And it was becoming more and more interesting to people. And they were sort of, it was popping up in my coaching practice so much already. And I also sort of found that when I would go to integration circles, uh, I was able to unearth parts of parts of myself. Right. Um, you know, in yoga class, so if you're teaching yoga class, it's like you don't really talk about all that kind of stuff necessarily. Or, you know, you talk in code, perhaps. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there I am in, in an integration circle and able to just be really raw about my experience. Right. And, yes. you know, lay it out. And as a result, like, things were getting processed experiences were getting processed that I hadn't really had context for just, just by the sheer act of sharing them in front of people who understood and then listening to what other people had to share gave new meaning and understanding to things that I had been through. Definitely. And I, and I was like, what? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it seems that that's when you can have, you know, an experience that might be transformative, but it really is afterwards during the integration that that's the, where the work really is. And that's when you do sort of learn those nuggets uh, um, to help you along your journey. You know, it's, uh, it's not just mm-hmm. the one, it's not just the one experience, of course. I've noticed on the site that you have an ongoing uh, integration circles. Uh, I guess it's all in the California area in San Francisco. Um, we do two a month. Oh, okay. One in Marin County. Yep. Marin County is north of San Francisco. It's on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge. Right. And then one in San Francisco proper. And then we do things like, like I have an, an online intensive starting next week. Right. Uh, I don't know if this will be out by next week, but if somebody wants to meditate with, you know, about, I don't know, 15 people. I think there's 15 people signed up so far. That we're going to spend four weeks just meditating and talking about breath practices and intention setting and how do we actually meditate in a way that's going to further our experiences rather than just kind of saying, oh, yeah, I meditate a little. And then what does that even mean? Right. For people who um, aren't that familiar with meditating themselves, maybe they've uh, had some psychedelic experiences but haven't really um, – tried meditation are there any sort of tips or suggestions for how to start that on your own or uh, what would you suggest someone does that hasn't really tried it before let me walk over to my whiteboard where i've got my <laughs> <other field. laughs> yeah. Yeah. but if, so, it's, if somebody's brand new to it what, what, what would you think what would you say what would i say is that the first thing that you want to I don't, well, I don't know what you want to. My first suggestion would be to learn to train the mind's attention. And so what I mean by that is, and this often gets twisted up. So I might dispel, you know, one of my favorite things is to dispel myths about meditation. Because a lot of the time, the meditation instructions that people get were given to them 
by somebody who studied with somebody who studied with somebody who studied with a monk. Yes, yeah, of course. And so monks, monks live different lives. And what is appropriate for somebody who is cloistered in a monastery and doesn't have anything to do but stare at a wall all day, right? And then you know sweep the floor and 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 you know chop potatoes and things like that. I'm not saying monks don't do anything, but it's a different relationship with the world. Yes, it's a different. That's life. much more detached, right? And I get really worried when I see people who have, you know, wives and kids or husbands and jobs and dry cleaning and you know side hustles mm-hmm. and then they're going to try and meditate like a detached ascetic poverty stricken celibate monk it just doesn't doesn't fit like, at all yeah it doesn't um, it doesn't fit it causes frustration and neurosis right. and it's going to probably even bum out your trip too yeah because you're trying to attain something but back, that, yeah, you just can't yeah right or that you don't you've been told you're supposed to want to mm-hmm. is a big thing so it's it, meditations that come from religious traditions have dogma in them. Right. So it's like, you're supposed to meditate to achieve total oneness. And it's like, well, what if I just want to meditate so that like, I don't, so that I'm a, a better team leader. Right. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I talk to people who are like, they are, you know, we're in the Bay Area. There's tech people, right? So you, you're the, a tech leader and they have a team of talented people, and, but it's high stakes stuff and they're frustrated and they are finding themselves losing themselves in the middle of frustration and stress. And they don't behave as skillfully as they would like to. Right. And so I, in my mind, you get to have any goal you want. Yeah. You, you can be whoever you want to be. <laughs> whatever you want to do but let's let's be the best at that right because it's different for everybody Which is, yeah. it's different for everybody and even it says in the bhagavad gita it's better to do your dharma imperfectly than somebody else's dharma perfectly right of course yeah uh, that makes a lot of sense so yeah should i go back to the technique definitely please so when i say training the mind's attention right we're aware that the mind goes all over the place usually to the past and the future, right? Or to things that we want to happen or things that we don't want to happen, right? You can kind of create a matrix. If anybody's listening and they want to practice, just draw a box and, you know, bisect it. So you've got four boxes, right? And you've got past and future and like and dislike. Right. And so basically, and then you basically go to those four places. And it's kind of good, like if you're meditating, you know, watch your breath, right? So you're training your attention to go to your mind, to, to go to your breath. Right. And so you breathe and you go to your breath and your mind wanders and then maybe notice to yourself, oh, did it wander to the past or the future? Did it wander to like or dislike? And then just make a dot in that box. Hmm. I'm doing it right now. And then go back to, and then go back to your breath. Right. 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 And so it sort of what's shows often you your- when that... Yeah, it shows you your proclivity, your, how that the mind functions in a certain way. And it dresses it up a thousand different ways, right? And it will be very alluring and glamorous. You know, it will make it seem like, oh, this is very important stuff to right. focus on. And it is when you're off the cushion, hmm. right? So I'm not telling you you're not supposed to want things in the future, right? We just said that that's fine. That's good. Mm-hmm. A healthy person has desires for the future, right? A healthy person in the world has desires from the future, but a healthy person is able to focus their, it knows what it is. Right. Right. If you're constantly, if you're afraid of dogs and all you're doing is thinking about, Oh my God, I'm worried in the future. There's going to be a dog. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you suppress that. And then every time you see a dog, you get real weird. Yeah. Right. You're not going to live your best life. No, definitely not. And so the, and, the yeah. goal is to, gain, is to gain insight, right? You train your mind's attention in order to get to insight, not to get to a, an empty mind, right? Yeah. So insight as the goal as opposed to empty mind as the goal. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it just it makes, it makes perfect sense. And not only in but the dog analogy as well. I mean, you may be worrying about dogs and may not even meet a dog. And so you're, you're spending that time 
um, you're right. yeah, you're thinking about that, and it really is wasting your time because it's uh, not it may, may not even happen. Well, one of the other big insights that often happens with some of my clients is they want a f- they want a future that they have been told they're supposed to want. So they've been indoctrinated and conditioned and their parents say this and society says this and they've just, and maybe they're even skilled. Maybe they're skilled at something like uh, software engineering and they have been chasing a dream and it's empty for them. So it's like, Oh, I keep thinking about how I'm all of these things that I'm supposed to want. And then when you actually come face to face with it, you realize, Oh, that's not even me. Right. It's just what I thought it was supposed to be me. Through your coaching, how do you get people out of that mindset? Well, one of, um, carefully, yeah. um, sometimes, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, sometimes carefully, sometimes a little brash, brusque. Um, but one of the hallmarks, one of sort of if we were to have almost like a shield, you know, how like, like a, um, I'm thinking almost like a college has a shield with Latin words around it. Yeah. You know, with their mottos and their various kind of very important buzzwords. Right. So st- sustainability would be one of them for me. Hmm. Uh, is that a lot of times when people come out of an experience, it, they want to go very hard and fast into dismantling their life. Yeah. And so the question is, is like, is there a way to do this safely and sanely and sustainably so that you don't just nuke your life. Right. And, and this is assuming that somebody's not in immediate danger. Of course. Yeah. Right. You're not, let's say you're not being abused and things aren't super terrible and you're not working for an organization that is breaking the law. You know what I mean? Right. Of course, um, yeah, yeah. You're just sort of like a lot of people are in, you know, decent jobs and decent relationships, but it's not for them. No, it's just hard to, it's you hard know? to, it's just hard to get out. Um, Carolyn and I, who, We've been traveling lately. Uh, um, mm-hmm. It's a challenge. It's a challenge leaving behind what people really expect you to be doing in your life to have a stable job and mm-hmm. own a lot of stuff. And uh, we're sort of trying to collect uh, experiences more than things nowadays and, and uh, just meeting new people and talking to interesting people like yourself and, and just trying mm-hmm. to live a life that's, that's more true to us um, than, right. uh, yeah, than what people, well, what we're really taught to believe is supposed to be the right way. But uh, it is mm-hmm. a challenge for sure. And it's, I think it would be, we're lucky enough we're in the position where the timing was right. But I think for a lot of people who, you know, with a family and a career and a mortgage, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to, to make any sort of major shift. So I think you're right. Maybe just stability is, is key. You have to sort of make sure that you're going to be okay first uh, before you, mm-hmm. yeah. But uh, maybe subtle changes, I suppose, uh, are, are, is the approach. I'm not sure. That made me think of, of two things. Is one of the things that we do often talk about is communication. It's like, how do I speak my new truth to the people in my lives in a way that they don't worry? Yeah, right. Right, because it's, it's kind of, it's almost not kind to just show up and be like, oh, I'm a crystal healer now. Right, of course, yeah. <laughs> or something yeah. like, oh, I do a psychedelic podcast now, I deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Because without, without any sort so of backstory... Like, is yeah. there something... Go ahead. I was just saying, without any sort of backstory, it, it, can, it can be a shock to people, uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. What would you say to someone who is stuck in a life that they're not happy with, um, would it be to make small changes first or would it be, like you said, stability is important, I suppose. Well, one of the, th- and that's just, you know, the stability is important. It's just sort of like the real baseline, you know, right. it's almost like a, just say a safety issue mm-hmm. uh, and it gets just more subtle from there. Um, one of the things that I'm really curious about with people is what's really calling to them. Yeah. Um, for example, I was talking to somebody once who was sure that they had to drop everything and move to the Amazon and just live a simple life in the Amazon. Right. And, and that, and, and we sort of started to poke around and what we discovered was like a lack of connection to nature and creativity. Right. right? The vision was I'm going to move in the Amazon, live in a shack and play guitar all day. Right. Yeah. 
And my question is, is like, well, how much do you play your guitar right now? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh man, I know I really should, but I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, well, okay. I mean, it's like, well, let's just start there. Right. Play your, go play your guitar and get back to me, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, exactly. it's like, how often are you going into nature? He was like, oh, I've got this great park near my apartment. I was like, cool. Are you walking there a lot? He was like, oh, when I first moved here, I walked in it like, like almost every day. And now I haven't been there in months. Right. Yeah. I was like, okay, well, like, let's just start there. You know, it's like, let's cultivate the energy of what you're wanting. Yeah. Right. Let's, let's, let's get to the root of what you want because we talked about how the mind glamorizes things. Yeah, of course it does. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's like, oh, in the future, I'll be in the jungle playing guitar. And it's like, okay, well, let's like, how about like tomorrow you're in the park playing guitar? Right. Start there. And see how that fe- and just see how that feels in your system. Yeah. Right. Because on one hand, we're looking, we're trying to get to an external situation, right? We're very externally organized. If I am get to be, you know, Mr. You know, Mr. White in the parlor with the <laughs> candlestick. Right. You know? I've got to be here doing this and then I'll be okay. And that's just the same broken system. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I want to feel as opposed to on the inside, I want to feel creative and nourished, connected to nature. I want to feel cozy and heart centered and connected. Yeah. It's like, okay, well like, let's just, let's get that. And then we'll maybe do some of the outside stuff. So it's like nurturing both of these worlds, right? Yeah, to create a whole being. Right. Yeah, I think people do sort of look at drastic answers to maybe simple questions. Before I want to go back for a second though, uh, about talking about the uh, your website and also just the stuff you've been doing online. Um, one of the ways that I feel I almost kind of know you a bit is through the psilocybin summit that you uh, put together in September. Right. Um, that was and- fun. It was a lot of fun. And uh, for people who don't know, it was uh, an online summit all about psilocybin, talking about the history, um, the legality, uh, the cultivation. Um, we've even talked since uh, to uh, Julian Vane um, on the show. Uh, that, and that was the first place that I sort of got uh, to know him a little bit. So I thank you for that. Um, but I was just wondering mm-hmm. after, because it seemed like an awful lot of work putting that together. Um, were there any surprises that you had that that you got out of it that you didn't think you were going to get out of it? Oh, I mean, so much. I mean, it just, I made so many friends. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You know, the, that was really nice, you know, getting to connect with people who, you know, I chatted with a little bit, you know, some of them I knew better than others. Some of them were, I was pretty close with and, but, you know, getting to kind of know some of the other people, um, even maybe working, there's a, there's a person or two that I almost kind of watch them come into their own in the community. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, I, I almost good. feel like, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back too much, but they're, you know, it's not me, it's them. I just happened, <laughs> yeah. I just happened to be there, yeah. but they sort of stepped forward and they were like, you know, I think I want to participate in this. And I think that like, I have this to offer. Right. And I was like, okay, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Offer that. And then now they're like everywhere doing everything and they're brilliant. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, they just sort of needed to, needed, you know, a little diving board. And that was really cool. And I'm drawing a blank on what, and of course I learned so much Mm -hmm. and I'm drawing a blank on facts. You know, (laughs) I can't, I can't, I can't be like, I learned A, B and C right Right, now. It was a lot of information. It was kind of a blur for me because I, I hosted most of those things live for, Mm -hmm. you know, four days or so. Yeah. But, um, and then just the kind of international audience was really cool. Yeah, for sure. You know, like I, there was, there were, I think there was, I think we had six continents. Wow. You know, you know, I, I know that there was somebody there from China. I know there was somebody there from Africa. Pretty, you know, I talked to the Australian psychedelic society a bit. And, you know, of course we had people from South America and yeah. North America and Europe. Are you planning on doing anything like that again this year or? Yeah, I figured we should probably do it again. Yeah. No, I really, we really enjoyed it. It was, it was great. I was reading the website, and one of the things that jumped out at me was uh, your meeting with Ram Das. And uh, I just wanted to know sort of the backstory of that. And, uh, you know, since his, his passing, I, I just thought it would be something I kind of wanted to talk to you about. Um, how, did you, how did you meet him? Um, well, he'll, 
you know, he would just meet with you. You could just say, I'm in Hawaii. I want to meet with you. And so I have, you know, I've sort of been, I've been in that lineage for like 20 years or so. Right. You know, I, I, you know, doing, you know, sort of, how do I say it without, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to sound any kind of way about it, but you know, my, my teachers were, were very connected to Neem Karli Baba. Right. And, you know, I, I guess I connected with them and, you know, felt compelled to spend time with them because I also sort of felt a connection to Neem Karli Baba. Right. And, and so, yeah, doing sort of those practices are not complicated practices, you know, chanting the Hanuman Chalisa and, you know, trying to follow his teachings um, have been really supportive in my life and really heart opening and purifying and mm-hmm. stabilizing. Right. right. And so, I mean, there's just something about kind of the power of spiritual love as an integrative tool. It made you think, made me think anyway, there wasn't, well, it seemed on the surface anyway, there wasn't a person more prepared to move on to the next chapter um, more than him in a way. Uh, but at the same time, I think part of his lessons were that that's in all of us as well, right? So it's, even though it was- What's, a, what's in all of us? The ability to reach that level of, um, just all encompassing love for, for everything. And, uh, right. Yeah. And just, uh, it's funny that it took sort of his, his passing to remind me of, of some of his writings and so on, but uh, an interesting person to think about how, what that transition would have been like for him. I think it's because he was so, it seemed so well prepared for it in a, in a way. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, like I said, I think his his sort of teachings talk to the fact that it's that connection is in is in all of us, and I, I think it's it's we can all get there. Um, it's just he was just such a great example of it. I, I found, um, done, and then done with humor as well, and uh, uh, just an interesting yeah. person. And, and yeah, and being you know up in Canada at the time, I never had a chance to to ever meet him but uh it just seems like it would have been an interesting person to meet um, well right there's nothing in in the teachings there's nothing in the teachings that that normal people can't do yeah you know there's nothing that he said that was there were no hard terms right it was mm-hmm. it was what are you doing right where you are exactly. right? what is the energy of the breath what's the energy of the uh, that you're that you're bringing to the people around you and how you sort of unapologetically just cultivate more love and kindness right and and just unearth the indomitable darkness that keeps you from being able to do that right right it is like a real willingness to face you know which is again something that that is super important because it happens in psychedelic experiences and like seven dimension technicolor Right. Is is being willing to face the darkness and determine and, and just say to yourself, this is workable. Right? It's like I have this I've got horrible stuff inside of me and I'm gonna love it anyway. Yeah. And in fact maybe I'll even just remove my judgment of it so that it's less horrible. Right. And I'll just be yeah. kinder not only to other people, but I'll be kinder to myself. And I'll allow myself to heal through that love that was um, reflected back to us by first by Maharaji and, and then by Ramdas. Right. And yeah. So it's like, how do we reflect love? How do we accept the love that's reflected at us, and then also just kind of reflect back love and acceptance to the people who come into our fields yeah. who desperately need it? Yeah, that's the thing. That's the simplicity of the lessons. It, it's, um, but it's it's sort of a simple idea maybe, but maybe, well, as you know, harder in practice for, for a lot of us. Um, along the same lines, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about, because I, that was one of the uh, blog posts that I read on, on your site about, about Ram Dass and, and another one, mm-hmm. which 
I love the title, by the way. Uh, Dude, where's my breakthrough? Um, Dude, where's my breakthrough? Yeah, I need a breakthrough experience. Yeah, and um, and in it you say you know anything uh, to increase the capacity to get out of your own way, basically, um, uh, helps with with the breakthrough experience. Now, I I know I've had times where I've been lucky enough to have a breakthrough, and other times where it's not, and sometimes it's set in setting. Um, in, could you go over like you, in the article? Could you go over maybe um, maybe what people are what what could hinder um, a possible breakthrough uh, during a trip, for example? <laughs> let me. I mean, let I know me a million... just scroll through my own website yeah. on the phone and look at a blog post I wrote <laughs> no, six months ago. No, I know, but you know, I have the idea. You got the idea. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> People are, people are showing up to the party, right? People have shown up, they read Michael Pollan's book and they want it to be a certain way. And this is one of the tricky things is because I have people who show up and they read Michael Pollan's book and they act like they want coaching, but they really just want a drug dealer. Right. They don't. Act, and I was like, well, I was like, well, first of all, like, I don't provide any substances. I'm just going to be with you through preparation and integration and those sorts of steps. And we're going to work on creating lasting change. Right. And they hang up on me. Uh, they do it politely, but they, they hang up. Right. Um, and so they're looking for somebody who will, you know, give them a bunch of drugs, give them a bunch of drugs, and like bang a drum for them, um, <clears throat> which is fine which is fine, but you know, they, they do a thing like, and then there's this huge expectation of what something has to be like. And there is this mentality that is, I don't know, is it sort of a consumeristic capitalist consumeristic kind of mentality, not to get too political or to be a pretend like I'm an economic economist, but where we kind of buy something and then we expect it to work the way we want it to work. Right. Right. It's like, yeah. I, you know, it's like you, you bought, we're on zoom, right? You paid for zoom. Yeah. You expect zoom to work the way it is. And that's fine because this is, that's com That's commerce. Yeah. Um, what is happening is people are trying to overlay commerce onto a mushroom, right. <laughs> and expect that, that the same sort of productivity that they uh, you know, this expectation of productivity that we overlay on to, you know, I don't know, technology or to, you know, objects of, you know, produced objects mm. for sale or services, goods and services. We, we overlay that onto a mushroom. Yeah. And we think that, oh, if I take the amount that I read in this article, I'm supposed to take that I'm going to have an experience like this. Right. It's just not, and, the case, yeah. and it's not the case, and it's sort of, and it's just a little bit entitled, really, mm-hmm. right? And and it's kind of ego driven, right? So the idea of like breakthrough, right, is like, oh, I want to break through my ego, mm-hmm. which yeah. is preposterous because it's like it, this. The definition of ego is is nobody, you know, ask six people what that word means. Yeah, no, and it's also I think well, I was talking with the Julian Vane about this, where like creating um, even a simple ceremony um, around the activity obviously helps. And if you're just giving, I think it's just showing respect and reverence to whatever you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. I think that just that's the mindset going in. I think you should have maybe rather than expecting any sort of outcome from it. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, is just uh, going in with just an openness and maybe maybe have some ideas of maybe that you want to work on a few things or uh, have some sort of intention going in, but um, expectation, you shouldn't really be expecting anything um, other than, well, just hopefully not a bad experience. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, it's so one uh, of the things we find is that this very active grasping is what we're trying to overcome. Yeah. 
you know, is, is one of, is, is what is the, at the root of our, the grasping is at the root of the suffering. And so if I, I want to have a release of suffering, the grasping has, uh, needs to be released. Right. And, and the root of the grasping is not, is, is the ego is identification is the grasping of ego. You know, the people act like there's some external that is the problem. Right. right? Whereas is the very, and really the ego is external to what we really are. Yes. So there is this self-centered, creation amalgam that we call ourselves right dave and dan hanging out dave right you know you're a person and i'm a person and we're these individual selves right with our own self-interests and problems and things like that and so we think that we want dave to be free from suffering Mm -hmm. whereas like the problem is the dave you know what I mean? It's like people, yeah. nobody wants to be free. And, and Ram Dass talks about this in, in the book. And we talk about it um, a bit in, in the talk I had with Doc Kelly. You know, as, as everybody, we want Dave to be free from suffering. We don't realize that we need to be free from Dave. Right. That yeah. the oppression, that Dave is the oppressor. Definitely. Yeah. He's the, he's yeah. the problem. And it's yeah. not personal. Like Dan's the problem too. Right. Of course. Yeah. 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 No, and we get in so our own way. Like my breakthrough is like Dave's breakthrough. Anytime, if Dave has the breakthrough, it's not a real breakthrough. Yeah. I mean, it works as a, as a conversational piece later, yeah. but in actuality, the breakthrough is a release from Dave. Yes, definitely. The Daveness. Yeah, it's saying goodbye to that. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, or you know, ventilating it. There's this one, there's this very nice minister. He started a non a nonprofit where he works like he works like with like the worst of the worst gang members. Right. And just like, it, he, and, and amazing things happen and just create so much love and light where there's like a lot of darkness. And he talks about how, you know, a ventilation of the soul, hmm. you know, it's like open up the windows. Yeah. So it was like, and then again, we are not monks. The idea is not to eradicate Dave. Right. Right. You, you, we, we need the guy to like get around to make get sandwiches made, yeah. get podcasts made. Like, like we're a bunch, there's a bunch of characters running around on the planet and everybody's got stuff to do. And that's just the way it is. But it's like, how do we ventilate Dave and Dan mm-hmm. so that the light gets in? Yeah. And we're not taking ourselves so seriously all the time. Right. That's the thing. Yeah. When people come to you with that sort of a question, how do you respond out? How do you cut through? Because like you said, we're not monks. We're, we don't live those lives. So we shouldn't really be trying to follow that sort of routine. Take but my med- Take my four-week meditation class. There we go. I mean, not to, I don't want to be like the yeah. hard sell guy, but <laughs> it's pre- there's, not like, yeah. there's not like a sentence that I'm going to say no, no. that's going to alleviate the suffering. Of course. Right? No. <laughs> these are, yeah. these but, are results. It's interesting. There's a really cool book called the Vigyana Bhairavatantra. And it is a meditation encyclopedia. It's got 112 meditation practices in it that are appropriate for householders. Wow. Right? Householders are people who are not monks. Right. And at the beginning, it's Shiva and Shakti, right? The divine pair, right? The divine masculine and feminine um, from, you know, Hindu mythology. Yep. Um, and, you know, Shakti says to Shiva, it's like, what is the nature of reality? What is this overflowing bliss and presence? And how can I know it more fully? Right? And so this is cool because what she's saying, she's not trying to leave life. Right? She's, not try- she's not an ascetic. Mm-hmm. She's not being like, how do I eradicate suffering? She's like, how do I come more fully into an embrace of the gorgeousness of universal presence? Right. Right? Which is a different perspective. And he says, practice. He's like, I can't just, this is like the, what you are asking to know can only be known through personal practice. Right. Yeah. You need to do the work. Yeah. yeah. Get on, get on the mat. Yeah. Get on the cushion. I was going to ask you about um, integration circles. Uh, you have obviously one. Start one. Start one in your neighborhood. Sorry to interrupt. I'm being silly. 
<laughs> what did you say? I, I couldn't even hear what you said there. I should start one in your neighborhood. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Everybody I, in the sound of my voice, start an integration circle in your neighborhood. Yeah. I think it, I think it's, I think it scares people though. I think it, I think, uh, they don't know how to go about doing that. Um, it really is. I oh guess my God, if only there was an, if only if there was an inexpensive online course that told people how to do it step by step. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel silly. Like talking no, my product, you know, no, mostly I, I just like to talk about ideas, but yeah. I did create, you know, it's a $49 course online. And it just basically takes you through all of the steps you need to start an integration circle. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no. It's... But please ask your question and, and get me out of this awkward sales pitch because I'm well, it was, I think... least favorite part. You've sort of answered it in in that, uh, but yeah, I was just I was wondering from that course what what would be, I, I, I guess I think people I'm trying to think of what would stop people from, or what would be the actual thing that would would prevent them from starting their own circles. I guess it's even just starting um, with friends uh, would be the first step. Maybe mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be anything <laughs> official. Community is real medicine. You know, just kind of being with folks who get you is is a huge deal, and doesn't happen enough. Even you know, uh, Chogyam Trungpa, um, problematic as he was, um, had some great ratings. And one of the things he said is that there's a difference between you know being in conscious, intentional space with people. And as he said it, because this is, you know, he dates it. He says, hanging out and grooving on the scene. All right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, I love hanging out and grooving on the scene as much as the next person. Yeah. But I also need time and space to kind of drop in with people um, to, to talk about what's really going on. Right. And, and I guess, I guess I think there are people out there that are, <laughs> maybe having their own psychedelic experiences, but not really part of a community. And I suppose there mm -hmm. are local, you know, psychedelic societies that they, that they can contact uh, to find sort of like-minded people. But, um, well, once again, your, your website, it's a good resource for that. It's, uh, it, do, it does sort of bring the community together. Um, yeah, hopefully. And there are, you know, and some people have, they're popping up more and more. Right, you know, psychedelic societies and things like that, and and it's you know I, I get messages on Instagram a lot, like, hey, I, I need I need a society. It's like, well, where are you? It's like, oh, I'm here. It's like, okay, well, I pull up. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, just, I they need me to type it into Google for them. It's like, okay, well, like, you know, there's one in this town, and they have a meetup group, and if you go to the meetup app, you can, you know, they've got a thing next Tuesday, and you can go and. When did you start uh, the website? About two years ago. Yeah. Um, well, and what's really nice is that a lot of folks um, find me from other people's podcasts. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. like, I'll get a call from, you know, a podcast I did a year and a half ago. Right. Right. Yeah. And so that's really kind of the magic of the world we live in today that, you know, the, the, the DIY aesthetic, you know, it's, it's like I say, make your own integration circle mm -hmm. is, it's kind of like make your own podcast. Definitely. Yeah. You know, I podcast for a while, a couple of years ago, if you go to, you know, my other website, you know, there's, you know, 30, 40 episodes, mostly on yoga and meditation. Um, but it's a revolutionary act to kind of take the, the creativity and the conversations to the people from the people, as opposed to sort of running it through some sort of corporate entity that doesn't actually care if you live or die. Well, that's the thing. It's, uh, it's, it's way more authentic that way for sure. Um, we've talked about well, your uh, meditation, yoga and psychedelics. How, I mean, it might be a fairly obvious question. I'm not quite sure, but how does each of those, um, enhance the other ones? Well, we've heard of set and setting, right? And we know that setting kind of means the space. And, you know, that means that you probably don't want to eat LSD and hang out under an underpass in New Jersey, you know? Uh, you sort of want to be in a place that is um, kind of nurturing and entertaining and 
safe and you want to be with people who are safe and you don't really want to have to worry about getting phone calls or, you know, having too many bothers and things like that. Right. That's mm-hmm. the setting is it's sort of the safe, comfortable and entertaining. I like to throw entertaining it because with all of the medicalization, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's almost like they, they want to extract all the fun out of it. Definitely. <laughs> I know. It's this sort of work, work ethic aspect of like, I'm not okay. I need to take drugs to make me okay. Right. <laughs> it's like right. Easy. Yeah. easy. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, 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 you know, are, are, we, are we participating in self-hatred? Right. On one hand, there's a, a healthy desire for growth, change, and healing. Yes. You know, on another hand, we can get all wrapped up in, I'm not good enough. I'm, I'll never be good enough. I need to fix this. And that can become a real heavy mental loop. Yeah. And that's, and so throwing in like fun, entertaining, lovely, yeah. I think is important. It is. And, it's, uh, it, and it, it also brings us into set. Go ahead. Wait, say what you're going to say. No, I was going to say to that point, um, I, I think you're right. I think, and especially the way, well, maybe that's the way that legalization or, the future of psychedelics, maybe it's the only, only way it can unfold if it is sort of that sort of clinical setting first and then maybe mm-hmm. something later on. But, uh, but you're right. It's almost looked at as, well, there's something wrong with you and here's something to fix it rather than I'm, I'm looking for something to just grow as a person. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I just, uh, just, I like that point. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Good. Anyway, so go on. I interrupted you there. So set the mindset is a little bit more overlooked and we usually mean mindset to mean you're not in a very bad mood right right you shouldn't be in a very bad mood when you take psychedelics yeah right um but meditation allows us to be more proactive with our mindset Right. Yeah. It, it gives us an opportunity to drive the ship a little bit more, to um, notice what's coming up, and to maybe course correct a little bit more. Right. There yeah. is, you know, a lot of talk about you know going through things. It's like, oh, we have to go through, and we kind of do. But it's like, with, with what skill do you navigate through? And are there times when there are just um, you know, perhaps negativities that are arising that want to be looked at from a different angle and, you know, getting a kind of a jump on it. A lot of times what I see people who haven't done any mind training is that they're sort of in this foxhole situation. Mm. There's a sort of trial by fire where, oh, I've got like, they're sort of learning on the fly how to kind of reframe and how to find acceptance and how to, you know, find context for things. Whereas if you're trained a bit, you're like, Oh, okay. I know what to do with this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just, there's, you're, you're driving, you know, you're driving a little bit more of a manual. So in some ways it requires a little bit more effort, but the, the idea of practice is that you sort of get muscle memory of the mind. Right. Yeah. You know, you default to compassion. You default to gratitude. Of course. Yeah. You, know, you default to like deeper inquiry. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. It prepares you um, in many ways a lot better than just coming at it with, without those teachings for sure. Yeah. And things like Julian's book help too, right? Julian's yeah. Yeah. guide on, there's a lot of people are reading books on why, like Michael mm-hmm. Pollan's book is, is a, a fairly good description of why people might want to take psychedelics yes julia's right. book is how to right i know that's what i enjoyed about it yeah uh i thought it build was build an altar make a ceremony do a thing right yeah. get a rattle you know yeah sing a song and you know? so yeah. yeah so those kinds of things also help to stabilize and orient the mind right? yeah yeah it, it, it does in in many ways now have you this may be a strange question but have you other than only b- twice, <laughs> <laughs> only twice. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> no. What were you, you going to say? I was going to say, have you? Is it is it usually the meditation used to prepare you for the psychedelic experiences, or is it something you're doing during 
the psychedelic experience or I'm just curious as, or both, or uh, obviously it's a good trainer or lack of better. It, it, it can prepare your mind to accept what you're about to experience, I would imagine. But uh, is it something that you're actively doing during the psychedelic experience or is it something you're just doing beforehand or both? You know, so the, there's, there's personal preference there. Yeah. But like I said, there are, so what you're saying, right, is like, do we only meditate on a cushion? Or are we trying to live a life of like active, loving awareness? Yeah, well, that's the thing. I know it's a constant, it's a constant goal or a constant mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, under I understand that. Um, I was just wondering if it's, cause since I'm not that well-versed in, in meditation, I, I've been guided a few times with some levels of success, but uh, it, it was just more kind of set in setting, to be honest. Um, I mm -hmm. think um, so. My experience is very limited in that. And mm -hmm. I can see during a, a psychedelic experience how having that training would prepare you to experience what you're experiencing in a, in a deeper and more valuable way. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess I'm just curious as to the actual practice of doing it, actively doing it um, while you're uh, having a second right. trip. Yeah. I'm just wondering. Well, and also keep in mind that we, we're throwing around medi the word meditation, like it means one thing, right? So okay. do you necessarily want to do this practice with the four boxes and, and, and noticing whether your mind is going to the past or future, maybe to, at the be maybe for at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, remember that that's, that's a practice for stabilizing the mind's attention and to turn on your noticing, you know, the noticing of, of what the mind is doing and to have the ability to come back to breath, right? To notice, Oh, I'm doing it. And my mind is going to a place and I'm coming back to breath. So that's not going to be real. That's not going to, necessarily be fun for six hours it might be rewarding if you're you know if you have a reason for doing that like those people do that practice for extended periods of time mm -hmm. or variations thereof to get you know for, for reasons of, of their own mm. but you know we were just i mentioned the vigyana bhairava tantra it's a meditation manual of 112 practices right you know and then, you know, I talk to clients and, and I help them build practices of their own. We tweak them to fit. Hmm. And so it's like when you say meditation, it's like, oh, well, yeah, you mean I, sort of it's a blanket term, taking, sure. taking yeah. a several breath into each chakra and chanting the seed syllable and visualizing the color, you know, from mm -hmm. the root all the way up to the crown. <laughs> so it, it's like, what are you going to do to, what do you want to do to fill up your space? Right. Yeah. And then, you know, another thing is that the meditation is useful for encountering difficulty. Yes, yeah, I think that's like if you're having yeah. fun, if you're just like having fun coloring, you know, you're coloring, you're listening to music, maybe you're moving your body around a little bit. It's like just have fun unless you feel called. It's like, oh, I want to like straighten my spine and like, you know, fill my body with breath. Yeah. Oh, I want to do this. What is great is when you have an opportunity to encounter difficulty. Yeah, I can see how. I mean, I don't know if it's great, yeah. but that's what meditate. It can be really useful for like meeting your demons in a way that's not gonna, you know, create something that's too traumatic. Yeah. Right. How do we meet trauma in a way that's not gonna re-traumatize us? Right. Exactly. I, I can see how it would be um, very grounding. Obviously, um, if people want to uh, find out more about what you're doing, uh, the TAM integration website's the best place, I would imagine. Suggest. Yeah, there's a contact form. It's, um, you know, you know um, Daniel at TAMintegration.com. That's actually a uh, Proton Mail account, so it's encrypted. Okay, great. So some people like to know that there, there's a level of security. Right. Uh, you know, shout out to Proton Mail. They are an encrypted email um, service that was developed by scientists at CERN. Yeah. I, which I, I think is cool because, 
you know, some people are talking about like, hey, I want to talk about mushrooms. And these guys are probably talking about like wormholes and alternate dimensions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's funny. Um, That's funny. You know, I try to explore the lighter side of things on Instagram. Yeah. So I sort of have, I, I enjoy, you know, a, a lot of the things we've been talking about are very heavy. Yeah. You know, it can be, it almost can be very maudlin and yeah, seem yeah. self-important and pretentious and things like that. Right. Um, I, I, I like, I find memes very, I, I just find memes hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. And so I make memes that are, you know, I think they're funny and you know, they're kind of irreverent and they're a little sillier. So and where, so, you know, the, the silly cam integration, that's I've got most of the I got most of the the social properties locked down. There's not a lot of competition for that name. <laughs> well, thanks, Daniel. Thank you for uh, coming on the show and and telling us about yourself and all the stuff that you're doing. That's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, keep yeah. me posted on what you're up to. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. I will. Um, yeah, have a great New Year and congrats on the baby once again. Thank you. Be well. So that was my conversation with Daniel Shankin from TAM Integration. To find out more about Daniel and what he's providing, check out tamintegration.com. To find out more about us, the psychedelicsuitcase.com is now up and running, and, and you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. The Psychedelic Suitcase is produced by Carolyn Myers and myself, your host, Dave McNee. Join us next time when we unpack more of the Psychedelic Suitcase. Until then, safe travels.